Fall. Good morning, everyone from Washington. Um, this is Christina Pushaw. I know I just did a live video two days ago, but I had to do another one today. And the reason for that is a conversation I had about the Russian Georgian War that turned into a conversation about Abkhazia. And in that conversation, I realized how many people, even here in DC, are pushing very harmful, fake, and hateful narratives about what happened in Abkhazia after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. So today I'm going to set the record straight with facts. Like I said, I, I always include my own opinions, but I also want to include facts. You can see some in the caption, some links. Um, and I'm going to systematically go through all the arguments and dismantle them and replace them with the truth. So first of all, I should start out for people who don't know, what is Abkhazia? I know all my Georgian friends know, but we actually never learn it in the US. So in the Soviet Union, um, which collapsed in 1991, before that, there were a number of republics for ethnic minorities. Um, each ethnicity, each of the large ethnicities had its own Soviet Socialist Republic. They were still controlled by Moscow, but they had some level of autonomy and self-government. Um, but Georgia was like Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was its own. But they also had Abkhazia, which is part of the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. But it's kind of a piece that has at that time, 17%, less than 20% of Abkhaz people, which is a different group, like completely different culture um, from Georgians. Anyway, they didn't have problems with each other. Um, this is not just an ethnic conflict, but I'll get into that later. So um, northwestern piece of Georgia, bordering Russia and the Black Sea, is called Abkhazia. And in 1991, it was a mix of dif different ethnic groups there. Like I said, less than 20% were ethnic Abkhaz. Um, that gave the, that's where the name Abkhazia comes from. It's totally different from Georgian, um, but they were neighbors of Georgians. 50% 50 of Abkhazia's population in 1991 was Georgian. That was by far the largest ethnic group in Abkhazia. Um, this makes sense. Remember, Abkhazia is part of Georgia in the Soviet times. Um, so again, 1989, right before the fall of the Soviet Union, total population of Abkhazia was 525,000 people, according to Russian census. Nearly 50% of those people were Georgians. 18% were Abkhaz. This will be important later on when I explain what happened. So 1991, minority of people in Abkhazia wanted to secede and create their own country. They were separatists, basically. Um, majority of people in Abkhazia did not want this vast majority. Actually, 1991, there was a referendum held. 98% of people in the referendum voted to stay part of Georgia. These are Abkhazian voters. Um, there was a risk. So by 1991, Georgia is just newly independent. The Georgian government realizes there's a risk of ethnic clashes because there are separatists. So the president at the time, Zbiad Gamsakurdia, was negotiating with the minority, the separatists, the people who wanted to create another country. Um, and he actually compromised with them. Again, this is important later on too, when I talk about criticisms of Gamsakurdia. So he compromised and said Abkhaz people get 28 seats in parliament. Now keep in mind Abkhazia, like I said, there's some autonomy in the region, so they have their own police, their own government, and they did have a parliament. Even though Georgians are 50% of the population, Abkhaz got 28 seats in parliament, Georgians got 26, other ethnic groups got 11. So Abkhaz people are the most represented. Even though it's a small part of the population, they have the most seats in the parliament of Abkhazia at this time. And this is because of a negotiation with the Georgian government under Gamsa Kurdia, Georgian president at the time. So um, the fact that a separatist was chosen as the head of Abkhazia's government that is, I guess, what you would expect, unfortunately, with such a compromise. Um, and the other part of the compromise to benefit Georgia 
is that the Abkhazian local government should not create its own army and they should not try to secede from Georgia. So what happened? Georgia upheld their end of the bargain. Georgia allowed Abkhazians to take over parliament and elect a separatist. And then what did they do? They broke the compromise and they raised an army and tried to separate from Georgia. So anyway, Georgia followed the agreement. They compromised, they made a big compromise, gave separatists a majority, Abkhazian side did not follow the agreement. Now I'm gonna go through some lies now that I hear about Abkhazia and explain why they're lies and explain the truth. And again, like I can't go into any everything I want in this video because I don't have that much time, but if you want to read more about it, I put um, a lot of helpful links in English and Russian in the caption. Um, so anyway, Alexander Berkovich, who is he? I don't know, somebody who calls himself regional expert. Um, I got into an argument with him yesterday. He said, one can mention Abkhazia was de facto independent from Georgia after the 1992 and 1993 war. That's a separatist war. Okay, yes and no. So again, Georgia does not control the territory of Abkhazia, but it's not independent from Georgia because every country except like Syria and Russia recognize it as part of Georgia. So the other thing is, it, the truth is more complicated about how this war actually happened. It wasn't a matter of the minority group, Abkhaz, rising up and driving out the majority, Georgians, independently. That's impossible. Like I said, there were 50% Georgians, 17% Abkhaz. They're not going to get rid of all the Georgians in the country without help. So who helped them? Um, you can probably guess, but the Abkhaz were backed up by Russia. So this brings me to the first lie. I heard from not only Mr. Berkovich, but a Kennan Institute scholar, Kennan Institute being a well-known Russian studies think tank here, Michael Kaufman. No Russian units were fighting in Abkhazia. It was all volunteers from the Caucasus. Well, okay, many volunteers did come. Who organized them? Who told these volunteers, often young kids, from different parts of the Caucasus, you're going to get a car, you're going to get jewelry. You can, like after we kill these people or drive them out of their houses, you can steal from them. This is what happened. Why would Russia allow this to happen? And it was more than that. New York Times in 1993, during the height of the fighting, reported Georgians shot down a Russian military aircraft in Abkhazia. How is the aircraft going to volunteer itself? It doesn't make sense. You, you don't have volunteer soldiers, not Russian units. They would not be flying Russian military aircraft. Okay, so it's true that Russian military did not conventionally invade Abkhazia, unlike what they did in Georgia in 2008. But with that said, Russia consistently, um, including, you'll see it in Ukraine today even, they will back up so-called separatists with selling weapons to them, giving weapons to them, recruiting new separatists, even sending their own Russian irregular troops. Um, this is a very typical Russian tactic, irregular warfare. They do it in Syria right now too. One good example is MH17, 2014, a passenger airliner was shot down over the conflict region in Ukraine. How was it shot down? By a surface to air missile system. This is not the kind of thing that can be operated by just random volunteers. They have, and it, oh, it came from Russia and then it was shipped back to Russia. So it has to be done with the direct support of the Russian military. Okay, anyway, so now we've established this is a pattern. We know what was happening in Abkhazia. Um, and now the question is, is it independent? No, like I said, it's, it, it's recognized as part of Georgia. It is not controlled by Georgia. It's a puppet state, totally dependent on welfare from Russia. They don't have an economy really besides remittances from Russia. And it's founded on mass murder. Okay, so the only reason Abkhazia exists the way that it does today with de facto independence is because of ethnic cleansing. Now, I know what ethnic cleansing is. I don't like using this term. I'm PR. Um, I think words have meanings. 
what cleansing sounds like it's clean it's not it was torture rape execution style mass murder of civilians children women elderly that's what ethnic cleansing is this is what happened in Abkhazia and who was the victims the Georgians the other lie I'm going to get into later is that it happened on both sides it did not but I'll get into that anyway how do we know ethnic cleansing happened to Georgians in Abkhazia um, don't take my word for it I included Human Rights Watch report from 1995 it goes into a lot of evidence. There's documentary evidence. This happened in living memory. People remember it and there's photos, videos, everything. Um, but the biggest evidence I think is population. So remember I said 1991, there were more than 500,000 people living in Abkhazia. 250,000 were Georgians. Now there are 40,000 Georgians. So where did the other 200,000 Georgians go? Ethnic cleansing. Again, they were driven out, their IDPs, internally displaced persons, or they were killed. So I, I linked a Russian census in the caption. If you can't read it, um, I mean, most of you can probably. 2002, population of Abkhazia was half, of, less than half of what it was in 1991. This is not normal. This doesn't happen without pushing people out or killing them. You don't have half the country just leave voluntarily, especially if all of those people are one ethnic group. Okay, now we've established how Abkhazia was founded. I'm going to talk about Michael Kaufman of the Kennan Institute's statement that both sides committed ethnic cleansing. Georgians were also doing it to Abkhazians. Wrong. Georgians were the victims of ethnic cleansing. Georgians did not commit ethnic cleansing. Again, why are there no Georgians left in Abkhazia? when it used to be the majority, the biggest ethnic group there. There are not two sides to this story. When I say there's ethnic cleansing of Georgian population in Abkhazia in 1992 and 1993, I'm not just speaking my own opinion here. This is a fact. First of all, OSCE passed a re resolution. Russia is part of OSCE. OSCE said there was ethnic cleansing of Georgians in Abkhazia. They didn't say anything the other way around because it didn't happen. Budapest. Lisbon, Istanbul, all of these resolutions were passed. OSCE summits throughout the 1990s saying there was ethnic cleansing of Georgians in Abkhazia. There was not ethnic cleansing of Abkhazians by Georgians. It didn't happen. Not even Russian parliament would say that. They haven't passed any such re resolution about this. Um, and again, considering Russia's role in the conflict, that tells you a lot. So, we have another lie. Now, I want to take down a typical Soviet argument, the kind of smart question or tough question people ask when they think that they can win an argument um, just by asking questions, right? So, Michael Kaufman of the Kennan Institute asks, so, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia did not win de facto independence and are not distinct ethnic groups deserving of self-determination. Okay, self-determination. Yes, Michael Kaufman, they are distinct ethnic groups, Ossetians and Abkhazians, and they do deserve self-determination, but how? How? Through ethnic cleansing? I don't think so. We have, let's go into some international law here. Basic human rights, International law, these are concepts that are not political. They're not based on any one ethnicity or nation. It's for the entire world. They're universal principles. And Helsinki Accords is one of the founding principles of human rights. Well, they say two main principles, territorial integrity, self-determination of peoples. Territorial integrity means that basically it's a breach of international law to invade across the internationally recognized border of another country or you know it's also an argument against separatism so clearly territorial integrity in this case in the case of Abkhazia that's the Georgian side the Abkhaz separatists undermined Georgia's territorial integrity now 
the argument that Michael Kaufman is making is Abkhaz are different people. Why shouldn't they have self-determination? Okay, let's think about it. Like I said, there was a referendum, self-determination in 1991. 97%, 98%, sorry, of people who voted in that referendum voted to be part of Georgia. So there is your self-determination. So taking away the right of the majority, vast majority of Abkhazia's population who voted to be part of Georgia through violence, that's not the same as self-determination. If we complete, if we conflate self-determination with ethnic cleansing, then human rights law has no meaning. So anyway, the main point against Abkhazian separatists in that time was not that they were supported by Russia, even though they were. It was that the majority of the population living in Abkhazia at the fall of the Soviet Union supported to be part of Georgia. So when did secession become possible? When did so-called independence become possible? After most, 80% of the Georgians were driven out or killed. How is this legitimate? It's not. Okay, now we establish Abkhazia is not a legitimate state and self-determination does not apply to Abkhazia in terms of human rights law because it was founded on ethnic cleansing of Georgians. These are all facts. What do our apologists do? Another form of lazy and sneaky argumentation, um, they move the goalposts. You know, we can prove one thing in an argument, but then they say, what about this? What about that? Okay, the next objection that Michael Kaufman, Alexander Berkovich had, um, it's not whether Georgians are victims, they realized it's true. But the new question is, what about nationalists? What about Georgian nationalists like the president Zbigniew Sokurdia at the time? Okay, they say his slogan was Georgia for Georgians. First of all, that's not true. And you can watch in YouTube link of him, Zbigniew Sokurdia himself speaking in Russian in the caption of this video, which explains what he actually meant. Um, he didn't say Georgia for Georgians. He said Georgia is a Georgian country with place for all minorities who have always lived in Georgia, okay? Not nationalist. So um, even if it was completely true though, his slogan doesn't justify genocide against Georgians. It's not an excuse. The fact that Georgians wanted Georgian language to be the official language of Georgia, that doesn't justify genocide against Georgians either. Nothing justifies genocide, okay? I don't know why I have to have this argument with people living in America who are regional experts who supposedly have studied this region or even anyone actually. Why do people think it's okay to justify genocide today? Anyway, um, like I said, I have to mention the slogan Georgia for Georgians did not appear anywhere in Agamsa Kurdia's speeches or campaigns. It was actually promoted by the opposition at his time in Georgia. Um, you know, like in the US we have all kinds of smear campaigns where politicians will put words in their opponent's mouth or kind of misrepresent what their opponent said. It's dangerous though in Georgia because even today, like people still, some people still believe this and Russian politicians like Medvedev still repeat it. Um, anyway, bigger point. I question the whole premise of criticizing Georgian nationalism here. Think about it. Georgia is this tiny country with totally unique language, culture, people, history. And they're kind of crushed between large empires that have occupied them, invaded them, blah, 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 throughout history. And under Soviet occupation, Georgia suffered a lot. So why in 1991, after Georgia was finally independent, was it considered bad for Georgian people to be patriotic and to love their country? They've been fighting to be an independent country for so long, no matter who the president was, he needed to love Georgia and put Georgia first. If there's ever a reason for nationalism, or I should say patriotism, it's Georgia in the early 1990s. They needed to build a new country from an ancient and difficult history, a history of occupation and invasion. And if Georgian people did not 
have a strong national identity. They would not have a country and they would not survive. So anyone who criticizes Georgian nationalism, so-called, if you're American or Russian, especially, you have no idea what you're saying. We, in big countries, we don't have to worry about the existence of our culture being wiped off the face of the earth. We have never been occupied by another power. So how can we tell Georgians about how bad it is to be patriotic and to want their small country to be Georgia? It's the one place in the world where they're Georgians, right? So are you really going to tell them like what's wrong? I guess. What I have to say though is we can all agree that ethnic nationalism is bad when it results in the oppression or racism towards minorities, right? Again, very basic. I shouldn't have to explain this, but I agree, this is bad. So was Georgia under Gamsakurdia oppressing minorities in 1991? This is what Mr. Berkovich argues. Let's look at the facts. Soviet era autonomous republic status was allowed to remain in Abkhazia after Georgia declared independence from the Soviet Union. Meaning, in 1991, before the war, Abkhazia had its own budget, its own police force, it had its own parliament. And that tells us a lot about the situation. This is not something that Georgia would grant to Abkhazia, considering like how small of a population Abkhaz were, if they were that racist, okay? So, same time, 1991, the representation of Abkhazian people in Georgia's parliament, no, sorry, in Abkhazia's parliament was increased. Like I said, Abkhazia was 50% Georgian, 17% Abkhaz. There were 28 Abkhaz seats, 26 Georgian seats, 11 seats for other ethnicities. So majority of parliament was Abkhaz. They were overrepresented, not underrepresented. When you have a racist nationalist country, they do not allow minority to be overrepresented in parliament. So this is very, very simple. And so in conclusion, don't trust everything you hear. Learn to think critically, get the facts and think for yourself. It's amazing. I learned a lot of this from a student of mine who, Luca, he knows who he is. He was my student in Georgia. He knows more than regional experts, so-called regional experts, argues better. So you never know like who you're going to learn from. Don't trust people just because they have some think tank after their name. You don't know who they're working for or where they get their information from. Um, and a message for Americans and other tourists who want to visit Abkhazia. I see this a lot. Um, you can do that, but try to at least understand the history first and think about what does it mean to go there for fun when hundreds of thousands of people in Georgia cannot even go there to see their own homes and graves of their killed relatives. So think twice. Okay, that's all I'm going to say for today. Thank you for watching.